3, 2, 1 Welcome Charles Thank you very much We are back in the summer and the heat of uh, Norway Yes, you, uh, you've been uh, away at work and and we have a little bit fumbled with the time a, a bit so we should have continued this podcast as a little bit stricter than we have but okay, it's coming when it's coming Yeah, we are not in a time pressure and we have been busy so that's good That's good Keeping the work up to track, and uh, now uh, now we're back. Now we're back. How's life? Good. Good. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> no, no, no more, no less. Yeah, no, not really. But uh, you know, when you get to my age, you have to cut down on all these things. Yeah, you have to cut down. But you can uh, you can brag about it. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. People so, believe you. Yeah, that's important. Last podcast, Charles. We was uh, on your first um, employment uh, tour. In Africa, and then we went to Indian Ocean. Yes, and mm-hmm. today we are going to speak uh, further on. Further on, yeah, yeah. And uh, for those of us who haven't listened to some of those pods before, it's uh, it's a series. You can go back and, and look up in uh, in Spotify or whatever. And it's from the get go when you went into the Foreign Legion in France. So the podcast is taking for it. Uh, about uh, recruitment, the specialist training, and and your first Two first three. actions. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So now we are going to start in 1990, and um, I have been in in the Legion for five years already. I've gone through basic training. I've gone through some specialist training. I have become a corporal. Uh, we have been on operations in in Chad. And we have been on another operation in the Indian Ocean, on some some islands there. Uh, have been back, more training, more education. I have become a sergeant, and uh, I am early 1990 uh, a young uh, forward storming tank commander in the French Foreign Legion's First Cavalry Regiment. But when you talk about your stay there for five years, <clears throat> many people it's uh, because. A normal service time in the Legion is five years, is that correct, yeah? That's correct. But after five years, what's happening then? Okay, so uh, after five years, um, uh, you can, if if the Legion accepts, or if you have a career, if it makes sense, uh, that you can sign up for uh, further years on. So uh, usually the maximum sign-on is three years. Okay, so if you've already been in five years, you can... Apply for new three years if you, you want can apply from. So the the official uh, rules are, if I remember right, and I don't think they have changed, is that it's between six months and three years contracts. Okay. So it all depends <coughs> on what you want to do. Do you have a plan? Do you have a project? You can sign on for shorter, or you're like me, you want to make a career, you just sign on for um, for five years. You know, for for another three years. Sorry. Not, yeah, okay. After five years, you sign on for another three years, and then you sign on for three years, and then you sign on for three years. Yeah. Oh, okay, so, so every every three year, three year, you have to sign up. Yeah, and then it's like a, it's a formal stuff. You have to go sign some contract. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah. a it's a whole process. Yeah, because uh, it's a part of the of the system. Uh, once more, it's a reality check. We all go back and say, well, I, is it this worth for the legion? Is the legion worth it for you? And and you go through a sort of a thought process and. So, so um, you actually have a like a conversation with some people about your career and what you're thinking, and, and that's correct. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. So mm. to keep track on what's going on. For me, it was quite simple. Um, I had some plans to leave, but uh, my boss said this was not going to happen. So I signed on. <laughs> Three more years. Yeah. Three more years. Yeah. But the salary and stuff. Is it bumping up a bit in salary? Because <coughs> people talk about the first five years, you don't make a lot of money. It's uh, it's not a high income no. <laughs> <laughs> occupation. If, if you're going for the money, you're going to the wrong place. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it depends. Um, salary varies from where you are. If you're on a military operation, you, you can get a decent salary. Yeah. Uh, um, it can be multiplied by by risk and by different bonuses. So that's interesting. But Generally, the salary is low. low. Uh, um, but uh, when you say low, what is low? Well, a figure doesn't mean for the worldwide. You know, I think now they are ma- now today. If I remember right, uh, a private legionnaire is making something like one thousand two hundred, three hundred euros per month. That's it. Yeah. yeah. But don't forget, he's a soldier. Um, 
he doesn't pay any food, any housing, any electricity bills. He doesn't have a car. He doesn't have any. This is bare money. Yeah, yeah, that's bare money. <laughs> yeah, it's bare money. I, I, I have never been able to, to spend the money. You know, uh, no. no, it's only when we go out on, on vacation trips that we suddenly empty the the bank account. Yeah, I don't know how that happens in reality, but. Always been surprised, but <laughs> somehow when you're on vacation, money flies. What was the uh, was uh, the RNA or the vacation times rough when you were like uh, young, staying at 25 years old and uh, the pockets full of money and went out on the town? It, it, it could be, you know. Um, I, I think I've said it before. You know, the, the problem is, you know, we are young men, quite innocent, yeah, and, quite uh, innocent, yeah. yeah, quite innocent, and and. Uh, south of France is a very nice place with a lot of tourists, a lot of, you know, there is, a, especially in the summer, there is a lot of, you know, beaches and parties and clubs and all that where we end up. And then, you know, we always get abused by young adventurous ladies that, that sure. so, um, but it's not cost effective. I don't know why. So, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but normally south in France was the place. Yeah, all all, all all the French units are in the south of France. Yeah. 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 All the uh, foreign legion units. Yeah. So. yeah. So, um, but the holiday place was was south of France was the big thing, or you did go to different countries as well. No, as a legionnaire, you're not officially allowed to go to another country. Okay, even uh, after five years. Well, it's a whole process. Uh, after a while in the legion, you can ask to become what we call rectified. You will get your real name back. Okay. So from your declared identity that you joined up with, and they gave you a fake identity in the beginning, that mm. you, then you're then serving under a fake identity. Then you can go through an administrative process, provide uh, the required documentation, uh, and then you will get an official decision and you take back your old name. About a fake identity, mm. what was the story about that? Well, can you explain for the, for the listeners? Because uh, the old myth was if you if you're, you're running from some kids and wives or uh, uh, the debt collector or maybe uh, some uh, prison sentence, you could join up for the legion. And if you if you did your work there, they give you a new passport, new name, and uh, blank sheets. Mm, yeah, the legion will when you join up uh, run a security check on you. Yeah. And <coughs> built on the discussions you had with the Legion Security and Intelligence Services, yeah. the Legion will make a decision either to throw you out or to keep you. This is if you have uh, an issue, outstanding issue, um, and and uh, they can decide to change your name. Hmm. Right? You cannot request it, or you can, but uh, it's not your request to change the name. But so, everybody no. who joins in get a new name and a new number. I not everybody. But um, I heard lately, I think now they put in a new process where everybody changes name. It's a bit easier to get back your real name. So in my time, not everybody changed name, uh, but uh, mostly people have. Did a you new get a new name? Yeah, I got a new name. Yeah. My name was Max. Max. Max Stafford for five years. Max make it. <laughs> yes. So most of my friends will call me Max. Max, yeah. yeah? Yes, yes. Yeah. All the old friends call me Max, of yeah. course. Because but you have the same date of birth and everything, or uh, also uh, change that one? It all also depends. So we usually change your name. Uh, the normal standard is that we keep your initials. Uh, we change your date of birth. We change your place of birth slightly. Mm. And we change your affiliation, the name of your parents. So... Um, as a little joke, many Swedes will know that from the time I was uh, the, the second in command in the uh, intelligence and security services, all the Swedes that joined the Legion and changed the name, the maiden name of their mother is Flexness. <laughs> <laughs> you gave them the, yeah, their yeah. mother's Flexness. Yeah. Yes, all of the maiden name for the mothers are Flexness. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's the reason? Why do they want the guys to change the name? Well, yeah. So uh, it's basically a very simple process. The, the Legion doesn't care about um, high-level criminals. Oh. Okay? Because, and, and, and honestly, they don't show up in the Legion because it's much, much easier to be in prison than in the Legion. So okay. we don't get so many of them. And, and, and the selection process is very hard. So it's hard to be, come there as a hardened criminal and find a place. And the Legion is not interested in covering anybody who has convicted a murder or done a 
a violent crime or a rape or, or something where, which include violence, most of these people are useless anyway in a military concept. So what do we end up? We'd end up with people that has um, uh, financial problems, mm-hmm. debts to banks, to, to whatever, uh, pregnant girlfriends. Uh, also, there is a few countries in the world where serving religion is illegal. Okay. So in order to, to, to cover them, uh, we will change their identity. Yeah. So those are the main reasons. Now, of course, it's very difficult to, to know everything about somebody. So we will take somebody through the uh, recruiting process and based on our gut feeling, yes. uh, we will accept him or not. Yeah. And as this person goes through the, the basic four months of basic training, we will run a worldwide security check on him. Um, if it comes back <coughs> as he had told us, well, then everything is fine. If it doesn't, everything is not so fine. Mm. Um, usually there are a few problems. And, and keeping in mind, you know, if a guy comes from Nepal and have stolen two goats in his village and he didn't tell me, I, I will never know. No, you know no, so no. There, there, that's that's the limitations of the system. So, but for for the old time, you know, Legion was started in uh, in eighteen hundred. Yeah, and and from the old time, there was not that picky about criminals because then they maybe want the the people who have nothing to lose. Yeah, of Is course, that, of course. Yeah, I mean, I mean we, we we don't have to go back to the eighteen hundreds. I mean, we can go back to after the Second World War. Oh, for sure, the yeah. Legion accepted thousands of German prisoners, and Europe was full of refugees having lost their whole families, having no future. There was no way to check, and the Legion needed people in the colonial wars. So, um, in those days, the Legion was, of course, less regarding. I mean, it makes sense, and mm-hmm. and and the systems were more open, and so. But there has always been a cooperation between the Legion and authorities. Mm. My my feeling is. Uh, from from the selections from before uh, earlier days and now today is today you get highly educated people who come from poor country and don't see they have like a proper um, future in the country they live and they rather go into the legion get a france passport and start a new life in europe and that's like a ticket in so so today the legion actually can be quite picky and and uh, and they have, they have to go if you have good school, good language, good training. Everything is good, so they can pick out cherry yeah. pick about the people. Yeah, of course they cherry pick, and you're completely right. But there has been a change in 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 the world societies. You know, travel has increased, airplane, Major, yeah. uh, whatever. I mean, a hundred years ago, it was quite a journey to go from South Korea to Europe. Who joined the legion? You yeah, know that yes, yes, yes. this didn't happen, um, and we see that in the in the history. You know, all, all the Norwegians that joined the legion in the old days, they were they were sailors. Sailors, yeah. Yeah, left they, the boat. They left the boat for any reason and joined the legion. So, yeah, yeah. Th- those are typical <coughs> examples. But today, internet makes the legion more known. Mm. People come from far away. Of course, the the, the French passport or European passport is a is a is a motivation case, and. This allows the legion to be able to select higher level people, mm, mm. and this is also a reason that we don't get these small criminals. Mm. They don't have a chance. Uh, maybe we spoke about it earlier, but it doesn't matter. You know, if I've, if I, if you, somebody from the suburbs of France doing little criminal activity, uh, or from London doing a, some seventeen-year-old uh, hooligan. Uh, shows up in Oban, wants to join, starts to run the testing system. He will be competing against a um, 28-year-old guy from Kazakhstan who's an officer in the army, who has an edu- engineer education, who is highly physical, who has been doing kickboxing his whole life, uh, who comes from a society that is more violent, mm. less woke, mm. less less, woke, yeah. <laughs> less, less, less ch- protected childhood. So... When you get into a military selection process, the little boys they they get filtered out. Yeah, yeah. And, and bear in mind, if I don't know if my my numbers are correct there, but it's about like uh, out of hundred people who are going to try, maybe ten go through. Oh, it's less than that. It's less, yeah, maybe seven. Well, one one in eighteen, one in twenty. You yeah. know. It depends where you start to count. 
Um, because, uh, of course, a lot of crazy people shows up at the recruiting center all over France. Yeah. And they can't pass the first medical test. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, okay, 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 so yeah. somebody can put that in the system. Was it a real candidate? Now, going through the system, that means technically being able to to pass the test. Let's say that you pass the tests. You are physically able, you have intelligence enough to pass the, the, the psychotechnical, the psychotechnical tests. Uh, you are in a medical condition that makes you acceptable for the Foreign Legion. Um, then you have one chance in seven. Yeah. The rest is competition. The rest mm. is competition, yeah. Yeah. So there are different different filter levels, those who are undesirable uh, I- immediately and those who get in, start doing the tests, and then as soon as they fail one test, they are out. And then you have another level that they pass all the tests as, accept- as acceptable, mm-hmm. but despite having ta- passed all the tests, they are not selected. I think we touched about it briefly before. In my opinion, it's one of the weak points in, in our system is that depending, we don't manage, we cannot control the flow of candidates. No. So if you are lucky, you come in a week with bad candidates and you're good, you get selected. Yeah. You join a week where there is a lot of good candidates. Well, you're competing against much more the difficult. Top of the top, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and if you're not selected, you're not selected, you're out. That's so, it. Yeah, so. There's nothing to talk about. Anybody who wants to join, select your week. Um, I have, I've never hided it and I always tell people, you really want to get accepted, you join on the 20th of December. Why is that? Five days before Christmas, nobody's coming, everybody wants to spend their family with Christmas, family and so on, so they don't join. So there are a few candidates between the 20th of um, December until the 1st of January, join. Join. That's you have a good chance. That's a good chance. <laughs> yeah. Would, would, would you recommend for a, for a young boy? No, uh, huh? no, no. To go? No, it's 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 extremely rough. Like, I can say like if if I was again nineteen twenty years old, I would do it all again. But it requires a very particular personality to adapt. I cannot say go. No, I, I need to speak with them first. Mm. Most people fail. Mm. Most people, not because they are not intelligent or they are not good or they are not strong or they are not fit or they are w- whatever, they don't fit in. They don't fit in. Yeah. So. Uh, about the selections, uh, if you are a France citizen, you should not. Uh, you're not automatically accepted. Also, they don't want people from France to. Yeah. to you can to join from France, but we change your name and your nationality. Yeah, mm. but from from the old days, they mm. didn't really want the no. France people inside. Of course, they want the French in their own army. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and, and uh, maybe I don't know if it doesn't meet or something, but uh, if it is Louis Philippe, was it mm. uh, the old uh, old king? Yeah, eighteen thirty. Yeah. He he wanted if he have to sacri- sacrifice ten thousand legionnaires on a colony, mm. no France mothers should sit home and cry. Yeah, uh, and, and I from, think from that was like the name, the Foreign Legion. So so is it that's a myth or what do you think? Uh, yeah, I think it might have been through through at at one stage. Uh, it's not true anymore. Um, France has now a professional army. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, it's better to lose a foreigner than to lose a Frenchman. It it made sense in the Indochina War. Um, today, France has a professional army. Mm-hmm. Um, they are really bothered because we take all the good jobs. <laughs> so uh, yeah, but I think I think like the logic was for the politicians mm. and and the government to run the country. Mm. They didn't get that unpopular mm. if uh, if they uh, spend some people in Indochina or whatever. And because it uh, was not a whole village mm. with young boys who never come home. Mm, 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 mm. So. And and of course it's it's much more it's also a complicated uh, complicated issue with if France is in war or not is it a security operation? Uh, usually when France get in war they die by millions at mm-hmm. least in the three last war with Germany. Yeah. And so it's quite um, 
politically it might have been a saying i don't think it has any real value because when you get into an operation like this it's always a mix of people and there are people from the normal army mm-hmm. from the legion um i honestly think it's a myth that probably is entertained by the legion hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it makes us a gives us a value in the real world um no no but but uh, in uh, if if uh, if france go to war if something happened to nato whatever and and uh, the france army and the legionnaire going in, but is it also meet normally the legion is the first group in before maybe the americans and whatever it's the quite early in the stage well yes and no because the legion is operating the type of units that would be the first to go in okay yeah so it makes sense to them, not because they are the legion but because they are uh, these kind of units yes and and then we can see that they don't send in the legion because it's the legion but they send the legion because we are ready We didn't, we yeah. all stay in camp, we live together. It's easy, boom. Yeah, so often it happens that the Legion gets sent because the Legion can be ready in 48 hours. We are ready to go. Yeah. The whole unit, thousand yeah. people, yeah. 2,000, 3,000, how no, many? No goodbyes to family, no nothing. Yeah, nobody on straight. holiday to pick up, no. no. So this is one of the key points with the Legion is that it has such high level operationality. Quickly out. Quickly out and this is also, it's a double way to have the people And the other hand, you have to have the people trained up to date in their job. Yeah. And that's where the Legion goes in with His Excellency. Because we spend a lot more time in camp. We have more time for training. We have more time for qualifying. We have people over a longer period. You have the experience. Yeah, but also not only the experience. It, when I have a guy who is trained and I can keep him for eight, nine, ten, eleven years, it's much better than having a short-term like we have in most NATO countries, they do three years or four years or maybe five years. Or maybe 12 months. And yeah, risk. then you have to start again every time. Yeah. <clears throat> so you have to put a much, much, much more effort into. So when you have your operational unit and it is op- your effort to keep it, it's much lower. lower yeah. Because you have longer term uses of the people. So this makes that the Legion is more likely to be ready to go at an operational level very quickly. Yeah. And... That's usually what happens. Yeah. Now, the regular French army will not be happy about that at all. No. And there's politics involved. You know, right now, the the five-star general who's in charge of all the French military forces is an ex-foreign legionnaire. Yeah. So I suppose we're in good eyes. But yeah. if he were to be from the naval infantry or from the Air Force or from somewhere else, you know, and then, uh, <coughs> yeah, there's always some politics, yes, even on that level. Yeah. Yeah. But... Um, Usually we are ready and we'll go. So um, I think it's a bit a myth that they prefer to lose a foreigner than a. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's not so cynical anymore. No. Mm. But maybe back back oh, in yeah. the days. Oh yeah, yeah, back in the days for sure, for sure. Yeah, then it made sense. Send to Africa, walk mm. himself to death. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's un- undoubtedly right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah because from all time you have like the death marches and stuff, and then they, they just. Of course, Keep on of course, yeah. and that's what made us strong was operating alone, out establishing procedures for this small units war, this mm-hmm. counterinsurgency war that didn't exist anywhere. Mm-hmm. European armies was made to fight big battles. Mm. We were very seldom confident like this. Actually, the Gulf War we are going to talk about was the first time it happened in 50 years. So we have always built up a knowledge base of independent, low-key counterinsurgency, very high mobility warfare out in the war. Is it in the jungle? Is it in the desert? Is it in the Arctic? Wherever, mm. where these kind of operations are. So that's where we have our expertise. Mm-hmm. So then, of course, if you have a limited operation, that's what you're going to send. Mm. You're not going to send your army who is lined up in Germany to face the Soviet Union in those days. Those, those units are not adapted for no. this kind of job. No. Mm. But also the Legion have like um, there's a lot to talk about the, the jungle group. Uh, I think maybe it was a documentary. It was like so Navy SEALs or whatever go in uh, in training camp with the uh, Legionnaires, and uh, the Legion kicked their butt. Oh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be so nasty with the SEALs. They are very different. They are highly trained mm. individuals, and I, I think they, if they suffered, they they suffered because. 
uh, we have a different concept. Mm. Uh, you know, a Navy SEAL will be an individual that's highly specialized, highly trained, at a high level of competence, and uh, he will be able to conduct a complicated, sophisticated, technical military operations in particular conditions, while the legionnaires will be in the jungle for six months. Yeah, yeah. give him a old jeep and a shotgun. And yeah, it's okay. and off we go. Yeah. And that, so it's another, it's another concept. Yeah. That is cheaper. It requires more dedication. Yeah. You are not an individual. I, I always try to tell people, uh, the legion is full of normal guys. Yeah. And individually, I don't think we are, of course, some are fit, some are less fit, some are, you know, uh, this is by around. But it's not Charles who's fantastic. Huh. It's the legion. It's the legion. It's when we get together. Yeah. in this framework of working, in this culture, in this, uh, I call it a sect, in mm. this almost religious belief mm. and way of doing things, that's where the machine kicks in. Mm. While most, by most, most of the um, European countries have built much more on individual competences and qualifications, we see that in Europe. Yep. It's an individualistic society where we develop the individual that he has skills and competences and so on. But when you build up individuals like this to a high level, you have to give them high salaries, you have to give them a family, you have to give them sport cars, you have to give them good life. Uh, in the weekend, they are on the beach and they have girlfriends. We don't do that, you know, no. We go back from operations, we find the girls, we shag them, we forget them and get back off. And so we are together, we are the family. Yeah. So it's we can go a little bit further when it comes to dedication to the group. Yeah. While the other is a group of individuals, we are not a group, we are a much tighter group. Mm -hmm. And when you take this much tighter group, put it in the jungle, put it in the desert, mm. train them to work together yeah, because as a machine. Bear in mind that this is this is young men who leave the family, they leave the loved ones, exactly. and leave the name. Yeah. They even get a new name. They, yes, they, yes. They start a new. So of course, they, again. most of them have, like me, had a family, you know, you know, didn't have, <clears throat> but you get much more dedicated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. While the special forces in different European countries or even USA have very high level of competency, mm -hmm. but they cannot do that uh, the same way. No. So that's very different. So I think if the SEAL team came to, to, the, to, the, to the jungle training course, um, I wouldn't pretend to have very much knowledge. I, really, I never made a mistake, so I didn't have to go there. Oh, so yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I was not sent to this unit. But um, um, it's a very, very harsh training. Hmm. It's very, very much on breaking down to build up this unit feeling. Hmm. So they're all 50 in the shit. Mm. And you can look on YouTube, there are enough films on how they do it and you really get pushed down on a collective level. You're mm. never alone and you're, it's the collective. Mm. So that could be surprising for these kind of highly trained individualistic specialists mm. that have other competences that we don't have. Yeah. But when it comes to send somebody up in the mountains of Afghanistan and start chopping the heads of Taliban, mm. then the legion is fine. Yeah. Mm. Don't need much. No. Just do it. Just do it. Yeah. But but when when you are out uh, serving out in the world, if in Africa or whatever, and you meet, or you have some joint operation, and you meet um, special forces, if it's from UK or America, or whatever, uh, what do do they think about you as a legionnaire? Yeah. Is it uh, is a good thing to be a legionnaire, or do they think you just uh, just treat people? No, no, I have always been met with the most utmost respect. Yeah, yeah. So the other special forces around the world, they they accept Legion as it as an uh, elite group in a way. But um, uh, we are not special forces. No, no, because no. special forces is just what I explained. Yeah, to yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but when you meet special forces and stuff, but do they respect the Legionnaire or they think it's like in uh, in the hierarchy in the different armies in the world? What do what do the other armies think about the Legion? But they will end up in hospital if they don't respect us. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> no, come on. Yeah. I, I, you know, it's just, you know. No, you can't. Uh, there is no ballerina. No, no, no. And in the bush, in the, fel in the war, you either do or you don't. Yeah. Mm. yeah. 
And I have seen many situations, but I I don't like to criticize others. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. But but is it like uh, if you if you uh, if you uh, if you talk to some Navy SEALs or whatever, you you generally uh, think it goes very well. Yeah, they think uh, yeah. they think the Legion is a. I mean, of course, we are different. Yeah. We are different, but yeah. we we usually do not work together. No, no, because they have a different. They are. It's a mistake to compare us to Navy SEALs or to the British SAS. Mm-hmm. Completely different. <laughs> yeah, we are what we call in French "troop de mêlée." You know, we, we are operational units yes. operating together, yeah. in you know, usually at company level. Yeah. So it's it's a completely different type of operations, mm. Mm. and maybe that's a mistake that many uh, Western nations have done is to emphasize on the value of special forces, mm. because you can be. Superman, but you can't do much. It's limited what you can do. You cannot do the same things that I can do with my thirty-five guys. No, but do, in in the Foreign Legion, do you have a special troops there? We do have a little unit, yeah, in yeah. the para regiment. Yeah. yeah, yeah, highly skilled, yeah. highly highly skilled, very very good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I was not in this unit, of course. So no. I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't comment on that. No, um, no. we were well. They're just uh, party girls, you know. <laughs> I can't criticize yeah. them. I will get ten emails within half an hour. You know? <laughs> <laughs> There is such a competition between my unit and the para unit that yeah. it's it, it goes into competition mode yeah. immediately. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's good. But I should say that in a, a in a in a, a nice way, I believe. Yeah. Of course, in a nice way, and and we always say like this: we are the only one who is allowed to criticize them. There are brothers, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. But between us, oh, there is no, no, you know, <laughs> and they have terrible descriptions of us, yeah. and, and and it must be like that because that's what creates the unit yeah. for them and for us yeah. and yeah. for the legion. Yeah. And for, so you should have this um, this kind of thing. So, yeah, I don't know how to do anything else than joke about them, but that's that's how it comes, yeah. and I expect the same from. But them. you you do also have this special force in the legion, yeah? The, yeah, yeah, guys. we do. Yeah. It's a small unit of the of the of the para regiment yeah so we have so, a para regiment uh, yes and this para regiment has a, a little unit I, i don't know exactly how many 30 35 people mm. that is uh, you know high low jumps and high level of training and do really special operations yes yeah. yes yeah. yeah okay uh, back on the track yeah 1990 1990 golf, golf war first one yeah so uh, what so, happened What happened? You know, in 1990, as I said, I'm a young forward storming sergeant in the French Foreign Legion uh, Cavalry Regiment, so I am a tank commander. And um, as a unit, we were very lucky. We went through, in the early 1990, uh, first six months, we go through um, uh, operational training process. I think we touched about it before, but we have different kinds of levels. So A, B, C, and D. So. We can say that level A, we start on level A and we train everybody on his individual skills. Mm-hmm. This, the, in, you know, uh, a platoon to keep it simple, it's 30 guys. Everybody in the platoon has a specific job. Yeah. So we train him in this job. Yeah. And then a platoon of 30 guys, they will have to keep it very simple and, and to understand. So these are long range desert reconnaissance unit. So our job is to go out in the desert, thousand kilometers, find out what's going on, coming back, maybe entering action, doing attacks, pulling out, moving. So we're a highly mobile desert reconnaissance unit. So at the level A, we will train everybody in their specific job. Yes. Okay. And usually we train them in the job next to them to have a double competence. Yeah. Yeah. And The next thing we do, we go to the level B. The level B, we will retrain the teams. Yep. You have a Jeep, you have an armored vehicle, you have a truck, you have a motorbike or the motorbike team. So we will train the teams to work together at the level B. Then using all the individual skills from A, putting them together in the team, get the team to work very well together. So now we have the teams, we build up to C, which is the platoon level. So now all these 30 guys, that are a group of two or three people in vehicles into we get into 10 vehicles, they all click together. So now we train this platoon of yeah. 30 people tra- working together, doing all the 
problems, solutions, and all the work that, to drill this completely together. When we have done that, we take all the four combat platoons in the squadron. A squadron is about 200 or a little bit less in a combat uh, squadron. but And we train them together in, we, till we become an operational unit. And then we are signed out as an operational unit. Yeah. So this is a cycle we go through regularly to keep everybody on the top level. Yeah. So I've been doing it so many times, I don't know. But it, it, it helps a lot because um, you, you know, transfers inside the legions are individual. Yeah. So we can get two guys come in, they will fit into jobs, they will get the training, or we get one sergeant in, or we get something in. So you have to go through this process regularly mm -hmm. to bring you up, <coughs> and at the end the whole squadron shoots together and so on. So we were trained up and um, uh, I was on vacation in 1990 in the summer, uh, exceptionally because we were not going anywhere and uh, yeah, struggling uh, with these uh, aggressive females, yes. um, trying to protect myself, little me, you know. Yeah. And it was life. very difficult, very difficult. I was struggling, but yeah. um, I somehow managed to, just, to survive this. <laughs> uh, this <laughs> these attacks. These attacks, yeah. And. Um, I think on the 2nd of August, something like that, I forgot to check, uh, Saddam Hussein suddenly invades Iraq. <coughs> and when we see this on TV, we, <laughs> we all know. <laughs> Run back to the regiment, yeah. and um, we didn't think anything was going to happen, but then suddenly on the Friday afternoon, they said, go. And uh, we spent the whole weekend uh, getting everything ready. Uh, France at the same time, it was a big operation because suddenly the French military started to release new equipment. So we got new computers for the cannons. We got new, a lot of new kit that suddenly came out. So it had to be trained on. We have to, so we, we needed to adapt. And um, the regiment was sent to, to, uh, to Saudi Arabia uh, late August. But when, when you was flagged out or sent out, mm -hmm. <coughs> what was the feeling then? Because this is first, then you are arriving to a proper war. Yeah, this was, <coughs> well, we didn't know it was going to be a war. No. No, you know, this was people who would look on the TV in those days. Uh, everybody was hoping for a um, diplomatic success. As mm -hmm. always, we always, it's easy to look back on history knowing what happened. But uh, those days, we didn't know. No. But we were, of course, happy to go. Um, and, um, so you was looking forward to it, yeah? Oh yeah, indeed. And I mean, even going to Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia is a big desert, so for us it was perfect. We yeah. are going to to what we know, what to do. And especially we were going as, for the first time, usually we only, the, the limited operations we had before would be at a squadron level. That means 200 guys going yeah. to Chad, going, well, usually it's a squadron that goes. But now uh, it's a whole regiment, it's 1,500. Uh, so it's much bigger and usually we would go by plane somewhere, you know, this time, no, they, we, uh, France got a whole bunch of ferries and... Uh, so you we went were, over the boat, yeah? Yeah, we went over a boat from south of France to the Suez Canal to Yambu in Saudi Arabia. So it was, of course, a very, very interesting uh, aspect to see the whole regiment move on. And how did that feel when everybody stay on the, those different boats? And, and how was the mood of the people? Or, or oh, it was uh, total, uh, total fun. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody was happy, you know. Yeah. This is really a big opportunity. and <clears throat> This is what we were waiting for, yeah? Absolutely. So yeah. uh, we arrived in Saudi Arabia. We got a transport solution. was transported up to what they call KKMC, King Khalid Military City, which is in the... Uh, north center of Saudi Arabia, not so far from Iraq. And we were deployed in the desert there. And of course, at this time, same time, thousands and thousands of Americans of, of other countries are, are, are coming too. So it was very interesting to see this huge machine uh, putting into place. This is a real war preparation. You know, you have airplanes flying around the whole day, helicopters flying around the whole day. The Americans struggling, we love that. Yeah. So of course this was a very... What did they struggle with? Uh, you know, these people were coming from Europe. It was the Cold War still, the Cold yeah. War just over. Or, mm. you know, so these people were, you know, um, um, we were close to an American unit. Yeah, we were close to an American unit and they were coming from Europe. So of course they are competent by all means, but they're not used to living in the desert. 
we are used to living in the desert mm-hmm. so and as the weeks the months goes on uh people would be struggling um i think we can go back and watch the tv i i i always use this example uh we arrive in september and finally we you know we do all the time training driving 300 kilometers per day getting the 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 vehicles moving the tanks running doing rest you know we had all the opportunity to train so we were training with all we would have a squad in this 12 guns 12 you can call them tanks they're not really but anyway mm. they have a big gun so we will travel by 12 up shoot rug backs is very interesting it is all on the completely flat it's almost like a naval battle yeah because there's this part of saudi arabia is completely flat flat everywhere flat there is no whatsoever hills or in no it's completely flat this part there is all the parts that are full of mountains and everything but this part was completely flat so you know we could see the we could see the container trucks driving on the motorway 80 kilometers away oh now if we go up top on the tank i could see the boxes on the horizon it's trucks yeah, yeah. so um, we were doing a lot of training it was exceptionally interesting because we were drilled up to a maximum of course we were quite worried um as not in afraid but as in concerned you know iraq had the eighth army in the world was that big yeah as was the information we got and they just did eight years of war with iran so, so some experienced guys we suppose they knew what they were doing yeah <laughs> you know uh, so we didn't consider them as as dumb you know or as uh, inferior we were actually taking things very very serious yes and uh, it was an amazing life because every day we go out and you know we were good attacked as, as exercise attacked by the american a10 airplanes or by helicopters or we would sneak up not let them catch us we would attack the americans they would attack us it was very dynamic very interesting so you're learning have a learning curve that is absolutely great so we stay there uh, quite a while and we coming up to christmas and this is a point i wanted to make and and french tv comes out to interview the french troops in christmas and uh, i love this was this with this american guy and so they interviewing guys from the air force they interviewing guys from the army and uh, how does it feel to be away it's your first time christmas and uh, you know now uh, and uh, even these guys from air force you know that's no news oh i'm away from my family for the first time is terrible and everybody says oh the food is bad we are struggling here and you know so they end up to ask this legionnaire from the infantry regiment a good guy you know and actually an american and uh, and they say so how are you doing and she's doing, oh, doing fine yeah everything is okay yeah don't you have any problems mm, no i don't have problem yeah really yeah no everything is fine says, are you sure you you know and this guy goes oh, i don't have battery in my watch <laughs> That's, it. <laughs> that's his problem. <clears throat> My watch is finished and I can't get a battery. That means that's a trick. So he of course got two Rolexes immediately <laughs> from that. So God knows who. <laughs> But uh, so it gives a bit the and that's where the legion is different. Yeah. They can send us there, we can stay one year, two years, doesn't matter. You know, we are here together. We are making our own Christmas, our own party and we know how to make moonshine in the desert. You know, that's not a problem. Get the race in and we'll fix it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> Well, of course strictly illegal and nothing of this ever happened but no, uh, no. in terror yeah. no so our, our our i think our level of skills was absolutely fantastic and our moral was absolutely fantastic but this is what we are made for yeah we were living the dream yeah many other unit from many other countries were there because they had to because it was dangerous because they didn't know what's going to happen so uh you felt at home we felt at home Yeah, because you stay together with your group you stay yeah. together with your family exactly and we go back to this talk we had earlier that's where the legion become different the unit is 100% operational over months in the desert and the guys are happy they are smiling that's that's our life you know we don't have to send anybody home for psychiatric reasons or we don't have any problems and because we do our job you know so and that's where you you have to consider what is you have to go for the reality uh you shouldn't train troops based on what you see in movies no 
You should train troops on the need you have on the ground to successfully kill the bastard on the other side. Mm. That's the goal. Mm. So we uh, we are extremely happy, and uh, towards January, it already becomes obvious that um, this is becoming difficult. And um, yeah, we were naughty. I had. One day, one night, we were taking some scuds. You know, they were sending scuds into Saudi Arabia. These yeah. missiles, you know, yeah. and there were some concerns that they might hit our camp. So we had a thing. You know, if the alarm goes, we spread out. You know, so not everybody die at the same time. Exactly. All yeah. the all the all the vehicles goes out in the storm. So yeah. we spread out in the desert in two minutes. Yeah. You know, and um, no, it was, um, and we had a visit of a French TV crew. Suddenly, alarm goes. You know. And we didn't take this so serious. We have had a few alarms before, so yeah. it was, you know. And um, we were a bit naughty, so I got this TV crew in my tank, you know, and we speeded and I'm up to it. My, uh, my American gunner and my Spanish uh, loader was a little bit mean with them. I said, oh, it's very dangerous. Oh, no, it's different. Oh, they will attack us with gas and everything. You have to close everything. And these guys peed in their pants. <laughs> 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 Yeah, because gas attack was also uh, sure. a concern yeah. in, the, in the Gulf yeah. world. Yeah. yeah, of course, we were convinced that we were going to gas us. They didn't, but uh, we were ready. You know, there are a lot of training and things to to resist the gas. Yeah. The gas is drawn in by as drops as rain almost, yeah. and, and then it liquefies or gasifies, and then yeah, yeah. Uh, it didn't happen to us. So all well, but also it's very complicated to do in a hot desert. It, Likely to be inefficient. Okay. So we are, but I mean, all our vehicles are pressurized and have filters and everything. So we were, we were ready to do that. But yeah. it wasn't a real concern. Um, when we finally got to do the real attack, uh, we were less proud. You know, I was the sergeant, so the sergeant is the youngest tank commander. So. Uh, I think we told it before, you know, the sergeant has the first tank, so the tank that goes first in line. Yes. And the joke of the story is that when his tank explodes, we have found the enemy. Okay. <laughs> so uh, so you're that the guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you can see that happening in Ukraine now. At, uh, mm. when I it's the same as, as uh, and, uh, and uh, they sent out UA500 UA in Vietnam, and mm -hmm. they go in to mm -hmm. get the enemy to engage, mm. and the gunships coming out. Uh, yeah, and exactly. Up, yeah? exactly. So your job is to go in, provoke, mm. get the enemy to fire at yeah. you, and, and pull back. Yeah, very simplified. You can say it like that. Yeah, um, I'm not going to go into deep tactics, but no. yeah, yeah. So, um, of course, we were expecting a, a strong resistance, uh, and as we moved in, uh, now we are in. Uh, I think it was February. Mm -hmm. uh, as we 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 moved up to a place called Rafa, which is close to the border, the whole regiment or the whole division deployed on the border. We had artillery day and night blowing them up, airplanes coming in. Uh, and then, them. then it's firing oh, yeah. all the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. day and night. Day and, night. Uh, and um, it was very impressive uh, to be in. This is a big war, yeah. you know. Yeah. And as we moved in, uh, the Iraqis kept collapsing. You get into contact, somebody opens fire, and the war is over. They are giving up, they are running away, they are losing. Uh, so. I was convinced that they are letting us in to As close uh, yeah. to close and kill us all. So I must admit we had some, uh, I had some doubts. Yeah. Um, it uh, felt too easy, yeah? It felt too easy. It yeah. felt too easy to my big surprise. Um, well, now once more, you know, a big war is what we see on movie. Uh, maybe in reality, it's not always as dense as we think. And you know, in a movie, you get everything. Mm -hmm. In in a war, you just get your little picture. Yes. So I just see the planes flying over me, the helicopters shooting missiles, and me treating some minor targets as we go in. Yeah. So you also engage and fire from your. Oh, tanks sure, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but there wasn't any good resistance. No. No. And. Once we had gotten really in, we got in, uh, I don't know how many, two or three days or something like that, four days. We get really in, we, we occupy with the first, the last attack we did, we took over an airport. 
was quite a quite a operation. But um, our biggest concern after that was collecting the prisoners. Yeah. So those were, um, and they were just dead scared. Yeah. So it was not not a really danger. They're going to try to turn on you after you collected them, or well, you don't know. You know, no, no, no. you don't know. So, um, so yeah, it was uh, quite a complicated job, but uh, and we didn't really how, train for that. How, how do you treat if you if you uh, if you get like a hundred prisoners or ten prisoners? What do you do? Uh, is it uh, like gathering you up and some uh, support team coming picking up and drive them in, or how how is this operation? We we have a team in in, in the unit that takes care of this. Mm-hmm. That is planned for that, but we we didn't plan for such a mass. So it was our chaplain, our priest. Uh, the regimental priest became the chief uh, prison warder. Yeah. So he kept them. Yeah. And he never carries a gun anyway. No. But uh, once they were rounded up, it went very well. Yeah. Yeah. But when when you uh, approach, if you have some prisoners or something given up, uh, rise on the white flag and and throw down the weapons. How do we approach them and uh, how do we do it to make it safe? So what do you do? You make them lay down on the ground. Yeah. Okay. And you keep somebody covering and you send somebody up very careful to search them one by one and you separate them. Yeah. Push them backward. As soon as you have reassured they don't have explosives, they don't going to throw a grenade in your face and you're not going. So you have to be very careful until you round them up and then get them up behind. Yeah. No, the biggest trouble was that... Uh, Rumor says, I don't know how true it is, but uh, apparently the, the Iraqi forces had told the guys there that the Legion is on the other side and they eat their prisoners. Oh. So, so now I'm trying to catch a guy who thinks he's going to be lunch. Okay. Uh, he has dropped his gun and he's just running in the desert. So how do you catch him now? Uh, you have to run after them with vehicles. and. Yeah. These guys are completely panicked. Uh, how do you manage to cool him down? Because he, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I must admit, I don't know how true that is. That's what I heard. But these guys were scared to death, yeah. and they did not want to give up. Not because they wanted to fight, because they were so scared. Yeah. And I think the Iraqis were um, a century behind, hundred years behind. Yeah. Their defense lines were laid up like in the First World War in Europe. Okay. So they got smashed up uh, completely, completely yeah. rolled over and smashed up. You also have, a, I think, um, the American uh, had a fight with the Japanese. You mm. also have some people just kill themselves, throw themselves with kids and everything over the cliff mm. because they also think it was going to be cannibalized mm. from the American troops because the propaganda system mm. for the Japanese was scaring the people. Mm. Uh, about uh, the foreign troops, so so it made a lot of trouble to many people who should have thrown the weapon down, so didn't do because they was scared of Britain. Yeah, and the Britain. Japanese had another type of motivation. Of course, this was uh, early 90s. Suicide attack had existed, so it wasn't known. So we knew that this was a possibility. Yeah. Possibility. So we were briefed on that. So we were kind of careful, but it quickly became apparent that. This was not their concern. No, mm. but uh, you have a story when uh, you was um, told to approach an uh, airstrip mm. with your vehicle. Can you take us through that one? Yeah, I was. Um, yeah, there is an airport in there. Was a fighter base Al Salman, which is um, I think the Germans built it. So it was an airstrip with the bunkers and everything, and it's completely flat. So nothing uh, to hide behind. Nothing to hide. So. Um, uh the squadron which is designed to attack the airport was us so to keep it simple we have 12 tubes 12 guns 12 vehicles with turrets on with guns on mm-hmm. so then they are divided in troops of three so mm-hmm. you have three six nine twelve mm-hmm. different platoons one two and three so the idea is to send six guns up to about two thousand meters from the airport mm-hmm from 2,000 meters, they can shoot very accurately into the airport. And then the other six guns would drive through the airport and having the infantry behind and would drive through the airport, go through the airport, actually not taking the fight, just pushing through the airport. Draw fire. And to 
then what we call tombon guard, you know, cover the other end yeah. so that the other comes up behind and cleans up mm. a, a regular assault. And of course, uh, <laughs> of course, when the decision and the number comes right, I understand. Okay, I have to run through the airport. You know, I thought I'm gone. You're finished now. I'm gone, and um, it. Um, we had to wait. Uh, of course, the artillery is slow, so we had to wait about an hour before we could get through with this job. So we are sitting there out in the desert, looking at the airport, uh, five six kilometers away. Uh, I was not convinced. I think I peed eight times in one hour. Yeah. Uh, and I, our old sergeant major came around. Bachtel is a very nice guy, a very fantastic leader. He came around and sort of had a chat with everybody. He also thought we were going to turn into light, fire, and heat. Yeah. So sort of, yeah, this is for the Legion and all that. So I was really considering why didn't I become a fisherman in the north of Norway. <laughs> <laughs> and he had a, a, a France saying, didn't he? To say what? Comme nous anciens, Moré Major. Yeah, it's a typical saying of the Legion. We do like our forefathers. Yeah. So even if I honestly wanted to go home to Norway and become a fisherman, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there was no way out. No. And my reputation is at stake and everything. So uh, you just have to go. And, and uh, this is a, a acceptable loss for the legion for the for the greater cause. To somebody have to draw fire. You have to do as your forefathers and go yeah, in front. This is war. Yeah, yeah. At one stage, you know, you cannot be uh, protected and protected of the protection. At one stage, you have to attack. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. this is how it is, you know. Yeah. And. Uh, Yeah, the, the 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 two other platoons came up to 2,500 meters, started shooting at the airport, and we just drove through. Uh, I went through the fence. Of course, I but picked up 400 meters of fence in my. Did you also get uh, uh American troop with you? At the so yeah, yeah, I'll get back to him. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so since I spoke a decent English, getting back to this, I had this American vehicle with me all the time, but it was a specialist vehicle that was censoring for gas. A sniffer dog, yeah. Yeah, sort of a sniffer dog. You had all these sensors and all that. It was an armored vehicle and had three or four Americans in there. Was it like a Humvee or was it? No, uh, no, it was It was a Fuchs. It was like a German, in Norway they call it a Sisu, made in Finland. So okay, it's a okay, six-wheeled okay, okay. armored uh, thing, you know. And um, so his duty was to stay with me. To okay. sniff for gas. Yeah, for sniff for gas and... My job was then to relay to the company or to the squadron if if there was an issue. So, to keep it simple, of course, this was the Gulf War. Uh, France is in NATO, but we didn't have the same radio frequencies as the Americans, and it wasn't we didn't have them. So, he had to actually come to me. So, so at the end, they, the the leadership, of course, forgot about the American. And um, so I get the briefing. I go back and I explain to the American that uh, you and me we're going to drive through the airport and. <laughs> And this guy was like, "Are you sure?" <laughs> I said, <like>, "Sure, <laughs> yeah." <laughs> well, then, yeah, <laughs> that's how it is. <laughs> so, of course, I got a bolo king because that was not the plan. They just forgot about him. So I drove through the airport with my American on my tail. <laughs> <laughs> He got his piece of the battle too. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, this is very fast. It was just a few minutes, yeah, but yeah. Uh, obviously, it was a uh, maximum. The, yes, on the red, highly full gas. <laughs> yes, and and the night was falling. Visibility was not good. It was raining in the desert. It was a mess. Of course, my two million dollar scope uh, for broke down, so I was out of the turret with my binoculars, yeah. playing rommel in the desert, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we raided through. Uh, shot a few rounds going through the airport and then finally got into got into position at the other side. The infantry was coming in behind, clearing up the airport. It went very well. Uh, we always the only worry I had with that is that the bloody infantry is typically Legion infantry. They are brainless, you know. You can so, fucking <laughs> shoot you if you're not lucky. Yeah. No, they got in there and they thought it was all funny, so they started taking pictures. Okay. So I saw the flash. So I almost opened up on the flash because I thought somebody was shooting at us. Oh. <laughs> so what's going on? But, uh, um, no, it didn't happen. So it all went very well. 
So uh, that, that airport attack was was quite uh, quite a thing. And the American guy have a quite a story to bring back home. Then, yeah, yeah, he yeah. was uh, because I don't. Uh, he, they maybe not used to do it in that way. No, no. and uh, and. <laughs> It's funny and all, all after, funny he didn't refuse. After he had a very big mouth, and oh yeah, rah, rah, after they were all American all the way, yeah. you know, he won the battle, you know. And I thought, well, really, <laughs> well, <laughs> fair enough. Fair so he was not convinced in the beginning, and he was probably right. But um, I didn't have the time then to deal with his problems, so no. he just stayed with us, yeah. and um, and uh, yeah, I think we even gave him a medal. Actually, he was yeah. probably happy at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that it was a very good experience. I see it as a very wrong place at the wrong time for the American then. <laughs> yes. So and I see it as a really really good experience uh, this whole operation because there is not many tank commanders in this world that has been through a tank battle, you know, uh, since 1973 and the Israelis there haven't been any. But of course now Ukraine has changed yeah, yeah, all that. Yeah, they yeah. they are struggling a lot um, mm-hmm. on both sides of course. So um, that's a new world. But if you're going to round up the goal for well, your experience uh, about you feel the food, the stay, the place to stay, the the, the the length of the time you stay there, what what when you think yeah. when you're thinking back at so, that at that uh, war, what 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 your uh, well, I I think back of it with with a lot of interest. So we have all these tactical and technical, but then we have the lifestyle. Is that when the legion moves in, you know. We went in there, put up the tents, and two days later, we sent a patrol into the the town. The town is called Hafal Arbatin. I was there not so long ago. It has changed. Yeah. And we bought concrete. Okay. So we buy concrete and make concrete platforms, put the tents on the concrete platform, put up kitchens. We really built, this is typical legion, every time we maximize to increase the living standard because we are going to stay there a while. Yeah, it's not a couple of weeks. You're yeah, going to stay there. And, 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 and once more, it's very, very important for your well-being, for your morale to have a real structure. Yeah. And to to have a structure, you know, we would immediately, uh, I remember we were, if you had nothing to do, uh, we'll keep ourselves busy, you know, even with art. We will pick up stones in the desert and make the sign of the legion and make uh, parade grounds and things like uh-huh. that. And in the legion, everything that, uh, if there is a stone, is painted white. Yeah. <laughs> and we make camps. And it sounds silly, but if you do like the Americans, they, they were suffering because they arrived there, they just dumped them in the desert with a tent and a camp bed camp or camp bed or whatever you uh-huh. call it. And then they just sit around and wait. We never sit around and wait. We always have a lot of things to do and keep ourselves busy. We keep ourselves very busy and we keep the moral high and the discipline high. Yeah. Mm. And um yeah, no we But you're still a young guy, was it in a party and stuff there or did you have some Well, there was a complete lack of women. And uh, yeah. uh, that's uh, obviously, but uh, the legion always have parties. Um we will make our own alcohol. Yeah. Okay. Of course, not in the operational environment. You oh, know, they'd be uh, separated yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, when you get into a rhythm, you can have two days, and then, yeah, we have a big party just uh, among the guys, and uh, tell uh, war stories and lies about women, and we invent uh, careers for ourselves, and uh, yeah, we're having a good show because this is the team, you know. Yeah. And they will tell stories from the homeland and. You know, you you build, this is like a family. It's mm. your friends. So, I mean, I was going to have Christmas with these guys anyway. Mm-hmm. And um, I remember, I think it's the 6th of January, the French has a celebration called the Epiphanies. Uh, Fête de Roi. I, I don't know how to translate. Anyway, it's it's a sort of a carnival. Okay. And all the officers of the regiment will dress up in carnival dress. And they make a theme and we have a big party and everybody is dressed up and there is an NCO who makes the theme and and everybody, I mean in the desert is limited what you can find. I'll oh, show yeah, you, I have yeah. some pictures. Yeah. Uh, so you dress these guys up and um, I remember my the company commanders were dressed up like the uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. <laughs> so they had some pics and they got went into town and bought some cycling dress and all that and they dressed up ridiculous and all. And we have a huge, and the Americans don't understand. They don't even have alcohol. Huh. And they come around and they're like, 
Ah, what are you guys doing? And we are just having a full show for two days. Yeah. So does that help us live better? Surely it does. Yeah. And this is strangely enough as a this is what keeps us operational in any situation, anywhere. Life goes on with all the complications that you have uh, in everyday life. They don't change. No. So, yeah, we had quite a few parties. Not that I remember, but. <laughs> <laughs> so when you think back at, uh, at the first Gulf World, that was, a, that was a good time for you? Yeah, I was, of course, shit scared. Yeah. Uh, let's admit that, you mm-hmm. know, it's not easy going into a battle where there are uh, other tanks and you expect them to be very good. Yeah. Um, but um, I really, really learned a lot. I learned a lot about leadership. Mm-hmm. Uh, my boss from Camo- Cambodia. Mm. So my platoon commander was a Cambodian, and he um, was very strict, very, very good soldier. Uh, he was bossing me around big time and taught me the, the trade of, of leadership. So yeah. I learned how to keep control of everything and don't accept any, you know, the Asian way. Yeah. Uh, and um, So I, I came back a much more competent leader, mm. and um, I was a fairly young sergeant, and... Um, My lucky drive through the airport uh, probably was something to do with I became a staff sergeant very quickly. So I probably got another stripe from that operation, which yeah. was very, very interesting. Uh, did you lose some of, uh, of your comrades in that operation? Not our unit. No. Some other unit had small losses. We didn't have any loss at all. No. They didn't have a chance. No. They wanted to fight from 300 meters away. We are fighting from three to four kilometers away. Okay. They, they didn't see daylight. And that's why I say they, they had a century or a hundred years. And, and I, I learned later, I think the Iran-Iraq war was very much a position war. Okay. It wasn't very mobile and it was restricted. So they dug in. And so they, they had dug quite seriously in. Mm. But we'll cut you to pieces. And then, so every time is the same. Just drive through and the infantry comes behind and clean up. Uh, what was the casualty on the other side? Do you know that? A lot. A lot? A lot. I don't Ten know. Ten thousands or, or? I don't know. Oh. But um, a lot of bodies. A lot. Yeah. Yeah. How, how do you uh, clean up that after yourself? Uh, we don't. You don't? That was not our duty. We left. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, we, we, I was not involved with that. I don't no. mm. But normally then they just dig up some mass graves and, and uh, what, they, what they normally do in a war like that? Well, it depends if you remain in control of the area or not. Yeah. Don't forget in the Gulf War, we went in, they came to an agreement with that uh, Saddam Hussein regime, mm. and we pulled back to Saudi Arabia. So they cleaned up themselves. They cleaned up themselves. Yeah. Uh, so uh, now if we were to take control of the area, we will regroup the people, bury them, and give them a religious fu- funeral according to their religion. Yes. We, yeah, that's, yeah. that's our duty. But... You're still a fairly young guy, and and you you've been out and you've seen about a bit. But when it's a lot of dead bodies, burned people, and stuff like that, did that inflict it yourself, or did you have a reflection around that? Because then it's it, it smell, it's it, 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 it's becoming real, real quite quick. Well, you know the problem is with the legion. You are living a harsh life. Yeah. So you are joking about this all the time. You need. I have like a Galgan humor on it. Yeah, yeah. you have a, a attitude. Of course, when you know they blew up, we blew up some tanks, you know, and you find the guys inside the tanks. They have been grilled. They look like babies with white teeth, you yeah, know. Yeah. So you sort of think a little bit second that could be me. Yeah. Uh, Because but, it's quite real then. Yeah. Then right. it's quite real, and and the smell is at least real. But that's when the legion kicks in with his long experience, where we immediately we joke about it. Uh, we are together. And if anybody seems to be affected, we, we we chat to him. I wouldn't say there is a process, but we have this together net that makes it not being an issue. Yeah, mm. but you didn't have like a or other you know, other uh, colleagues have like a, a minutes of truth. Is is this the way I want to live my life? Run around and uh, ending other people's life, or it's just another day? Oh, we won the game. Yeah, we were so proud That's of it. ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I don't think anybody had that uh, that idea. No. Do you have re- reflect on it uh, later in your life when you get older? No. No. I'm lucky. Um and I see um 99% of my friends <coughs> no, didn't uh, that's what soldiers do. 
Mm. If not, you have to find another job. You know, this is yeah. Yeah, but sometimes you can have a dream. You want to be a soldier. You have a you want to do something, and when it really happens, uh, it don't taste the way you. But you've Imagine already you gone taste. through a basic training in the Legion. That yeah. is harsh. Yeah. You all go through a selection process. That is harsh. You have been trained in an environment that doesn't allow for your Feelings. little weakness to become an issue. So usually you will always already have fallen off the train. If you couldn't handle it. Yes. Once more, we go back to, in general, European armed forces, highly trained individuals will not have been exposed to such an environment. Mm-hmm. Then it can be harsh hmm. because it's not the problem is from a I'm not a psychiatrist at all, but in my opinion, the problem is not how harsh uh, or how traumatizing the situation or the image can be. It is the difference. If you go from a rough life to a little bit rougher, it's okay. Hmm. If you come straight from vacation, Oh, if you come straight yeah, from yeah. A, a good life, your yeah. whole life, and you end up in a horrible war, uh, the shock is the much con- more. The contrast is too big, yeah? Uh, the contrast is much bigger. And we we don't have that, or we don't have, we have that to a lesser degree. Yeah. Because of a harsh life, because yeah. of harsh training. because, yeah. And it's a training that is all the time. And we are in the group. Yeah. And we are doing this together. So, and there is a very, very strange humor that allows you to, Make this uh, not be a part of your. I mean, and but and then another thing is because uh, you always uh, put pressure on that it's uh, quite important your position in a group. And after you've been in a like a uh, operation like this, you're starting to get battle hardened, and and that has to do something about your position in the group when you come back at your homeland as well. Of course, yeah. Uh, and I I felt that immediately. I. I we came back uh, to France after this. If we leave the Gulf War, we can come back to yeah, that if yeah. you want. And and I went straight to platoon commander course uh, for a bit less than a year, special training. And I was detached from my squadron, went to uh, a special training course to, to achieve that in within the French army. And after that, I was sent to Djibouti mm. as a young platoon commander. And then I arrived as the new battle hardened the new top gun oh yeah the yeah. new top gun i was and i was a horrible guy uh, <laughs> <laughs> you was a prick yeah no 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 not like that but i was um i was definitely um yeah i had confidence yeah a lot of it yeah yeah you didn't take any shit no my uh, i i was I, i was given a platoon so usually in a platoon you will have four combat platoon in the squadron, and they will be each commanded by a lieutenant. That is an intelligent young Frenchman coming from a university and engineering education. Mm. And then you will have one last combat platoon which is commanded by an NCO, in my case, me. Yeah. So of course, I know all the guys, my second in command went to sergeant course with me. They all know me, they all know my reputation, they all adore me, I'm more like a band leader. Mm. And I would outrun, outrun all the other platoons with ease. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I remember wise advice from my company sergeant major, which is the oldest in Ciola. He's uh, an Indian. His name is Basra. He's uh, ever he listens to this, he lives in Texas today. Yeah. He's a fantastic man. He taught me a lot about life. And he was telling me, you know, Charles, don't put the officers in the shade. They will bite you. He was right. I learned a lot. Yeah. Oh yeah, I got shot in the back yeah. <laughs> yeah. by them yeah, yeah. because I was too cocky, too yeah. experienced, yeah, too. Yeah. So um, there is something to learn there. Yeah. Humility is—it's uh, not a strong thing in the guys who come from north of Norway, you know. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so back in the Gulf War, uh, you're cleaning up, and um, how long was was you deployed? So we arrived in September. Went through all the preparation. We attacked <coughs> January. Air attack started in January, if I remember right. Ground attack in February. Uh, we packed up, uh, went back to Saudi Arabia. There was a lot of organization, uh, decommissioning of, of, of different things, and we got put back on our ferries and we traveled back to France. I think we were back in France in May. Okay, I, I yeah, think, yeah, yeah. 
April, May. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Close to nine months out then. Yeah. yeah. And uh, of course, we came back like heroes, like national heroes. So yeah. it was. Uh, Is it like parade in the street and everything? Or? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Flags and stuff. Oh, yeah. We were welcomed really like heroes. Then we had 14th of July. Where What we feeling were, did you have then as a legionnaire and you you're, uh, establish yourself in the hierarchy mm. and, and you're walking through the street like a parade? Was the, it your uh, You progress? are very proud, of course, very proud. And we had the parade on the 14th of July in Paris. Ooh. And uh, it's a nice story. Uh, I don't know if you know Paris very well, but the, the parade is on Champs-Élysées. Yeah. And... Um, We were parading with our armored vehicles. Yeah. So here I have my 20-ton tank with six wheels yeah. and a turret, 105-millimeter cannon on top. It's, very, it's called an AMX 10 RC. Very nice vehicle, very masculine thing. And the plan is we are parading. And you're sitting on top with your rolls in your mouth. Yeah, well, no, not in the parade. You know, you have to behave. Yeah, yeah, you have to behave. Well, you would do it anywhere you can. But uh, <laughs> not in the parade. There are yeah. certain... So anyway... The goal is we are going to do the parade and uh, getting down Champs-Élysées to Place de la Concorde. Uh, we would turn left in front of something called, um, something with La Marine, I don't know, mm. Hotel de la Marine. And there is a straight long road there which is called Rue de Rivoli. And somewhere down at the end, there is the French municipality, the mayor of, of Paris or yes. the commune, whatever yeah, yeah. yeah. And... Uh, I was appointed with two other guys to go there and to, we should uh, be there and we should be participate in a cocktail oh. with the mayor no, of no, Paris. No, 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 no. And this was Jacques Chirac, which was the later the president. Oh yeah. And um, so we drove through the the parade as we should, uh, uneventful, and from the uh, salute and all that. And uh, I was stopped there in, in the, because there was, was traffic. Yeah. So the French police is organizing traffic, and then they block the traffic to get us through. So the French gendarmes tells me, go as fast as you can to the mayor and stop there, you know. Mm. Oh, no problem. What a pleasure. I'm driving in, because we have taken all the limitations of the tanks because of the war. Yeah. So I was driving in 120 kilometers an hour in my Ooh. tank down the Rue de Rivoli, all sirens on, driving into the... Uh, area where the uh, Hotel de Ville is, where the town hall is, Whom, and, and the mayor is there waiting for us. Uh. I stopped, get off, you know, and salute the mayor, later President Chuck Chuck. And he was very, very keen. I didn't know at all. He he used to be a platoon commander of tanks in the Algeria oh. War. So he was very keen, and he received us very well. But it was a little moment of glory, hmm. where whole Paris is standing still for you. That's nice. And your 24-year-old Norwegian. Oh. Yeah, that was, that was uh, great fun, great fun. And, and this gives you a motivation to yeah, go because, on. Have yeah, you fight for your nurse and, and the yeah, nation and yeah. they actually appreciate it, yeah? Yeah, you know, we were we were like kings, you know, and and, and, and him, the Jacques Chirac, he was so nice to us, you know, we, we were treated in this. I mean, they had all the high people of Paris and everything, you know. He didn't care. It was only his military boys, you know. And, I don't know, it was... Um, When you go out on town, on the town later that night or whatever, how, uh, how, it's how, very how? difficult. Yes. Yeah. Now the 14th of July night in Paris is um, it's a complicated operation. Uh, the whole city is celebrating, and uh, you're definitely a part. Yeah. Um, I was always a gentleman peep, and didn't peep, participate in anything like this. But oh. but uh, yeah, some guys would go there, and uh, once more, you know, there are all these adventurous women trying to take advantage of yeah. you, and uh, yeah, you every nightclub. Uh, Yeah, no, it was uh, very, very difficult. The Legion has a traditional nightclub. I don't know if it exists anymore. It was called La Scala in those days. And, uh, yeah, we would arrive there. Is it like you, you're treated uh, first in line, you don't have to pay for getting in? Oh, we don't pay for anything, and we're treated. Well, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Who's going to stop us? <laughs> <laughs> we have 40 guys. <laughs> uh, no, no. So that's, um, that's quite a rewarding thing for a young man. Mm. And you learn this... Um, You got this experience to feel that the nation appreciates you and you're honored by all ways. Uh, they hang medals on you to make you look nice. Mm. And yeah, that's something you bring on in life. And as you can see, strangely enough, uh, I have much more of these memories. I, I only remember the good thing. 
you were you you were talking about the dead bodies in the Gulf mm. Forest. I haven't thought of them for years. No, 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 at all, at all, at all, at all. I I remember the party when we came back. Yeah. Well, I behaved very well, of course. Talk over, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And talk about other guys. Then. Yeah, 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 yeah. My friends were terrible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But it, that makes the difference because uh, after uh, after Vietnam War mm. uh, and uh, American troops come back and American soils, uh, they wasn't treated as hero, you know. Mm. They was treated really bad, and, uh, and that could be quite hurtful when you 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 feel you sacrifice yourself and your friends for the country, and you come back home. At least uh, at, at, at the country, I knowledge that uh, at you done something for their freedom. Especially, they suffered a lot because mm. uh, fighting with the, with the, you know I think the Vietnam and the, and the, well, Korea of course, but also the the French in the China War uh, was the first Western war against communist regimes, yeah. and they have no concerns for losing people. No, so they can throw thousands and thousands upon you. So you will lose. Mm-hmm. If your ratio, is, if they are hundred and you are five, uh, you're not going to win. No. Uh, even if you're Superman, uh, so they took a lot of casualty, came back, and was not welcomed. Um, I can't comment on that political thing. You know, I was a very young boy, but um, I can understand that that must have been much much harder. In Norway, we have we have uh, like Western states and stuff like this. And I have some friends who are served in the Norwegian army in some some mm. special uh, branches. And I was talking to one of them, and and um, when we were talking, I was just thanking him mm. for 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 the freedom mm. uh, of me and my child. Mm. And then it struck me: I I don't believe he actually was used to the no. the, the civilian actually thanking them because if you don't have the soldier, the world is not going to look. If you agree to war or not, mm. uh, the world is the, what it is, yeah. Mm. And and uh, if we don't have those young boys who are willing mm. to sacrifice themselves mm. for our freedom, mm. we have nothing. We don't have the we don't have the free country. If but, we but didn't I, have I, soldiers, I, we would be speaking German today, for sure. Mm. So so I think that that's something for us all to actually thank the boys who was willing, yeah, to do it because without them. We we wouldn't speak rather English or, or Norwegian today. <laughs> yeah. On the other hand, I, I firmly believe it's the it's also the soldier's duty um, to take his place. Sure. Um, it's it's a very very sensitive topic, but I I am very much against this. Uh, uh, poor the veterans. Uh, it's not poor the veterans. We don't need any mercy, you know. Uh, no, but a, mm. a simple thank. Yeah, if you don't want to give it, uh, it doesn't matter. No. Uh, because we know what we have done. Yeah, we know what we do. And personally, I am not ready to. I'm not ready to to rely on you or to rely on the population. It's very nice when it happens, yeah. but I cannot rely on other people to give me my honor and my satisfaction. Because um, then you have in a very, very dangerous, vicious cycle where you can go into victimization. You know, uh, they're not doing anything for us, and we do. So, so we have a veterans um, thing in the legion. Yeah, and this is one of the of the main topics we have is that we are proud of what we have done, mm-hmm. and we organize things ourselves. We mm-hmm. don't wait for the municipality to organize for us, so we don't expect anybody to take care of us we take care of us between ourselves mm-hmm. and we forwarded our and by doing that people will give you respect yeah but but in the same way when when you go down to say and and um, if uh, if you if you have some Norwegian troops then mm. if, if they go out in Afghanistan whatever yeah and uh, and do their bit mm. for a NATO cause mm. If we would close down Karl Johan in Oslo mm. and we had a parade mm. when they come back home, mm. I think some of the boys would sit sit uh, with the, left with a different feeling. Mm. Do they actually they, 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 are part, they, they are part of the community in Norway and 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 the government and uh, the prime minister? They actually appreciate mm. them, you know. Yeah. Instead of now, it's like okay, you get a medal because you. And, and it's behind a castle in Oslo, but to actually 
give yeah. them the the respect as so, you get them because I would imagine that feeling you had in France in mm. Paris that time uh, build up of course something really special in you of course of course so but this is not a, a military problem this is that our culture is different yeah and Norway doesn't have a military culture no and that can be good or bad it's not for me to judge no. but but I'm that's what I have to establish yeah, yeah. they don't have a military culture so we cannot we cannot judge that and expect it to change no uh, it will require a completely different reset of the whole culture so mm. we have to avoid that we have to say okay it doesn't exist it doesn't exist uh, because then you go into oh, oh, oh limitation mm-hmm. and i don't want it that mm-hmm. that's that's not going to happen so um but luckily norway doesn't have a have a military need like france it doesn't have a worldwide uh, coverage and no, no. Our, our our military is there to defend the country and it yeah. makes sense mm. and i just my humble opinion we should really try to work on the will to defend the nation yeah. by all norwegians yeah uh, i think we are very focused uh, it's not my problem and i haven't got anything to say on that officially of course but i see a lot of focus on spendings and material which is sure important mm. But the most important is the will. Mm. Create the will in the population to fight. Mm. Mm. Look at Ukraine. Mm. Mm. So, um, yeah, we we talk about uh, some um, some you know, different uh, thing, but about, about um, somebody who wouldn't learn the language. The if if they like uh, have two parents and and uh, some of the kids don't want to learn the par- one of the language and it's as you said it's because they're not proud of it mm, mm. they don't have the will yeah you have you haven't built it up yeah the, the proudness now you're going to get me onto a political line here it will yeah. become very hot <laughs> <laughs> it is for me essential to be proud of our nation to be proud of our culture to be proud of and if you're not proud of it we're dead yeah we're finished finished so we will discover that we are in big trouble one day mm-hmm. but since we cannot admit it uh well we just have to wait yeah. then we will have old guys like me and you who will fix things mm. Mm. back to basic back to basics yeah. i'll be here i'll be here <laughs> <laughs> so uh, but o- other thing uh, i would touch on uh, in the end of the the pod here is uh, the the struggle of life life is uh, everybody can try it life is not easy all the time yeah and uh, even if you are army or if you have normal work my job whatever you know we all get into hardships uh when we're going to look at the mirror and don't know hmm. what we want in life but as you talk about the foreign legion and the building up a group keeping yourself busy routines and stuff how important is that for your mental health you think I think it is absolutely essential. It is, you know, I I do this myself every day. Yeah. Uh, I have to make a planning for myself because like everybody else, or maybe worse than others, I'm lazy. Yeah. Ask my wife. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm lazy. Um, I, I need to put together a planning for myself and do the things I maybe don't want to do and when I do them I get a little reward of some hormone that triggers and it makes me happier yeah. and if ever I am in a, I'm lucky I'm in a struggle it will take me one tenth of a second to remember so many destinies from around the world that are a million times worse than me mm. and I have no rights to complain and i'll just get on with it and and that is a strength everybody can develop yeah and and i don't have advice to give to people but do that yeah. um same as when you when you stay in the golf hall and you paint all the stones you find white you keep yourself occupied you do something about what instead of staying in a in a you putting your, your field bed on sand with water or whatever you you make a foundation with concrete you do the best of it and and you try to to make that a good living space as possible you, of course you and you see that as a pattern with people too i i i always speak for just myself but i, I can imagine that 
if you leave a house and your garden is full of rubbish and the rubbish is floating around everywhere, your life, your quality of life goes down. Yeah. But if you put in that little effort to clean up, uh, I think we have a famous psychologist, psychiatrist, to clean your room. And, and yeah, Jordan Peterson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he touched on many interesting points. And, and we are actually doing that, but by, by cleaning up things, that making things organized, you you get a reward. Mm -hmm. If you don't get a reward, there's something wrong in your head. Mm -hmm. uh, and this and we see this. I mean, we see this in people that are struggling with drugs, that are struggling with with alcoholism, that are struggling with with life. They, that's what lose track. They stop shaving. They stop cleaning themselves. They stop cleaning the room. They go there, and and you get into a vicious cycle. Never go there. Never go there. No, and that's what we do in the Legion. We keep everybody should be shaved, clean, wanked in the morning, yeah. and we should be up and running. And there is no room for any drift no. because the drift is terrible. It ruins you. Yeah. And you you get that education for life. Yeah. And as once more, ask my wife. I'm lazy. I yeah, if yeah, I can yeah. get away with it. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, I think Jordan Peterson uh, is, a, is a phenomenal guy. He says, um, was it, was an activist or whatever, or, or uh, some want to change our environment and, and uh, the climate and whatever, and, and say, well, what can we do? And say, clean your room. Hmm. And say, what, what? And say, if you are not educating yourself and treating yourself the best as you can, you're never going to be in a position to change anything in the world. Hmm. If you don't, if you don't have control on your own life, how can you believe you're going to control other people's life? So start with yourself. To have these routines, make things uh, clockwise. Then maybe you can educate, you can read something, maybe people are going to start listening to you and you can change something. But you cannot sit here and don't do nothing for your life and think you can change anything. But If but you can't even keep your room clean, how are you going to change the world? It's not no. possible. No. So that is very important and I think that's a, that's a major takeaway. Uh, from any structured organization, and it's get multiplied by hundred in the legion because we have people from all over the world, from all culture, all religions, all colors. 140 yeah. nations of yeah, yeah. yeah. So we have to get everybody together into a strict system that gives rewards, hmm. that values achievements, and that keeps everybody busy. We you know we're in the middle of the desert, hmm. and we have put up five tents, and we have a concrete platform. We have put on white stones. We have a flagpole with the French flag. We have stones collected together. We make a sign of the legion everywhere. We have brain ground, you know. And the Americans come around and visit and said, wow. What's this, yeah? So first of all, you are proud. Yeah. This is us. Hmm. You know, hard work went into it. But also when you wake up in the morning, it's structured, hmm. you know. And you clean up everything, everything is packed, five minutes, everything, your bed is fixed and everything, and you get out shaved, you know. The process is on, and you have a much, much bigger well-being in yeah. your life. So you, you you can say that structure, strict structure, give you freedom. Of course. Yes. Of course, and it gives you pride, and it gives you a lot of freedom, and it keeps the devil away. Yeah. And that's an important part. Yeah, because believe you me, Take a little tent and a camp bed and go in the middle of the Saudi desert and sit there for nine months. It can be long. Yeah. Quickly be very long. Yeah. But if you keep it in a structure, days just fly. It's close. And you get these rewards by achieving. Yeah. Hmm. Next podcast, What? where are we going then? Well, next podcast, we are going to, to Djibouti, which is Djibouti. a small country in uh, East Africa. We are going to Somalia. Uh, we are going a bit to Ethiopian border. We are going to explore some fantastic savannas, deserts, some ancient history, yeah. some geology, and some political things in the Horn of Africa. Nice. If people want to be on the ride, some some leadership uh, advice. Maybe I was starting to learn enough to give advice. Yes. Some achievements. Cool. Sounds like a plan. Sounds like a plan. Thank you very much.